Also, Marie-Lou is very deeply involved in the community and in several interdisciplinary initiatives focused on the health of the planet. She's a co-director of the Mathematics Climate Research Network. And this network has invented online collaboration years before the pandemic. Marie-Lou was telling me already in 2013 how easy it was to collaborate using online uh, tools. Marie-Lou helped found the Institute for Computational Sustainability based at Cornell University. And she was one of the co-founders of the SAM activity group in mathematics of planet Earth. She's a popular public speaker, especially concerning the role of mathematics for, for sustainable development issues. So the title of her talk today is Harnessing Math to Demystify Tipping Points. Let me tell you all that uh, it's the first time simultaneously to being on Zoom. We are live on YouTube, so you have the choice of your platform. At the end of the talk, there will be a question period, so you can uh, write your questions in the chat, either on Zoom or on YouTube. Mary Lou, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, Christiane, and thank you for that, for the kind invitation to come and talk to you guys, and also for that very kind introduction. So I'd better share my screen. So we're going to talk about um, math and tipping points, and I hope make a few connections to places where math can help with unusual science. Our plan is to just confirm that we have a clue what a tipping point is, talk about them in the context of alternative stable states, then maybe think about how a gradually changing environment when you have alternative stable states can induce some tips. Think about that, how all that understanding may provide some support for decisions. And then think about, okay, how about a repeatedly kicked environment rather than a gradually changed environment? So first, what's a tipping point? Um, we'll let this guy, Jeff Little, give us one idea of a tipping point. He's explaining to people how to get to know their kayak. So here we go. So what he just showed us was one is one way of thinking about a tip. He certainly showed us two stable states. One was a desirable stable state, one was less desirable. And there was this important threshold in between that he was figuring out where it is. That's one type of tip. Um, and just thinking about tipping and decision support, we use this knowledge of that threshold, that offstage really important actor. We never see the threshold. We see either the upright um, kayak or the upside down kayak, but he was finding out where the threshold was. And that's all about the shape of the hull of a boat. So we use that understanding of, where the, of how to design a threshold to um, create all kinds of different boats that give us a trade-off between stability and agility. So it's just a sort of, we're used to this. We're used to tipping points and decision support um, in the engineering world. So there's um, a lady on a very stable boat fishing. So now let's turn our attention to the lake on which she's fishing. So this, this lake is beautifully clear. It's, um, it's a shallow lake. The light, the sunlight can get through the lake to the bottom, the lake bottom. And so vegetation can grow on the bottom. That vegetation can, can support little micro life, which can turn can support larger life. and. Um, fish and ducks and the vegetation holds the, the mud down in the bottom of the lake um, in the sediment. And so there's all kinds of feedback keeping that lake clear and healthy and full of biodiversity. But unfortunately, lakes come in another flavor as well. They can become turbid. One of the things that triggers turbidity is if, um, if there's more and more nutrient runoff, perhaps coming from agriculture or industry. So 
the nutrient feeds the algae, algae grow, that stops the sunlight from getting through. So then the vegetation can't grow on the bottom. So then all that life is not supported. The only thing that can live in the lake is bottom feeding fish and those fish stir up more of the mud. And so you see there's a feedback that um, creates the, the turbid state being stable. So these two, there are feedbacks tearing these two states apart. You either have a stable clear lake or you have a stable turbid lake. Another way, another thing that will trigger the turbidity is if other things that can provide nutrients is just age with all kinds of leaf debris and um, other vegetative debris just gradually filling up the pond and turning it into a marsh. But we'll focus for now on um, agricultural runoff as our driver. So let's think about how we can use math to make a conceptual model of what could be going on in the lake. So the nutrient we'll focus on is phosphorus. And we want to think about the phosphorus, the amount of phosphorus in the lake and how we'll do that is we'll look at the flux of phosphorus in and the flux of phosphorus, flux of phosphorus out. So we'll therefore see the net change of phosphorus in the lake. So how should we measure the phosphorus in? There are a couple of ways it could come in. One is recycling from the sediment. So this nutrient recycling has an interesting nonlinear behavior. The response of the sediment to the water depends on how much phosphorus there is in the water. So this axis, can you see my pointer? Yeah. Yes, I'm seeing some nods, thank you. So this axis, the horizontal axis is the P axis, that's the phosphorus in the water, concentration of phosphorus in the water. And then the vertical axis is the flux, the amount of, the rate of change, the amount of phosphorus coming in in one day, should we say. And so when there's low phosphorus in the water, that stimulates only low recycling of phosphorus from the sediment. When there's high phosphorus in the water, that stimulates high recycling of phosphorus from the sediment. And this simple nonlinear curve is, um, is the first approximation to that nonlinear response of the sediment to the water. And then the height of this curve, this curve is pushed up or down based on how much phosphorus is coming from the watershed. So this might represent the local agricultural or industrial runoff. So that's what we think of as the daily phosphorus coming in. And now how about the phosphorus leaving? So how does phosphorus leave? The lake water is just um, flowing through this lake, it flows in, it flows out, and how the amount of phosphorus flowing out is proportional to the concentration of phosphorus in the lake. So that's just a straightforward proportionality function for output of phosphorus. And if we put these two graphs on the same axes, then maybe they overlap like this. There's a variety of different ways they could overlap, but it could be like this. And now let's think, how do we use those, the input and output together? we can think about what's the daily change in phosphorus. If you've taken calculus, you know that's estimated by the derivative of phosphorus with respect to time. If you haven't taken calculus, that's a treat in store, but it's not necessary for today. You can just think of the daily change as the net change in phosphorus, the amount coming in each day minus the amount going out, so net change. Okay, so here's a question for you. What happens if the phosphorus concentration in the lake happens to be exactly A? So what's so special about A is it's a point of intersection of those two curves, which means the flux in is exactly equal to the flux out. So if we look at flux in minus flux out, the net flux is zero, which means the change in phosphorus is zero, which means that the derivative is zero and the phosphorus is in equilibrium, there's no change. So if the level of phosphorus in the lake happens to be A, it will stay at A. So we can see two more points like that. At B and C, we also have phosphorus equilibrium for the lake. Okay, what happens in between? So what happens if we choose P between B and C? So now we can see that above this region, the flux in is greater than the flux out. So that means that the net flux is gonna be positive. So the daily change is positive, which means that the flux, the phosphorus will increase. If the change in phosphorus is positive, it means the phosphorus level is increasing. 
And so the phosphorus level will increase towards C. Okay, what happens if we're the other side of C? Now, the daily flux out is greater than the daily flux in, which means the net flux is negative, which, so the daily change is negative. The, if the change in phosphorus is negative, that means the phosphorus is decreasing. So there's the phosphorus decreasing. So what we're seeing is that either side of C, if we, if, if we start with phosphorus levels either side of C, the lake will evolve to have phosphorus level C. We can check the other regions between A and B and below A, and we'll see that if we start either side of phosphorus level A, the lake will evolve towards phosphorus level A. So we can color those points. It's just like the kayak. The red points are the stable phosphorus levels, and the blue point B is that invisible threshold, that offstage actor who's really deciding which of these stable um, states the lake will evolve into. So that P axis now is containing a lot of information. Let's extract that axis. It's got all the information about who's stable, which direction um, different initial conditions take us, where the, where the lake will stabilize, what phosphorus level the lake will stabilize at. So now we're going to do something very simple, but mathematically very convenient. We just oui, expand that lake. Is that a question? Pardon, on a dit que les questions seraient à la fin, je crois. Shall I carry on? Would you like me to answer? I haven't understood the question. Well, now the person is mute and I have, I cannot repeat the question, sorry. Jean-Pierre, put your question in the chat if you have one. Okay, and when it comes in the chat, you can let me know. Yeah. Um, so where were we? Oh yes, we have this horizontal axis which contains all our information and we're just going to stand that axis up vertically. Trivial thing to do, but we're going to find it really useful. And now what do all these different equilibria mean? If we think about it, the equilibrium A, that was when we had a low phosphorus level. Low phosphorus is when we have not fed all that algae and it corresponds to the Clear Lake stable state. Equilibrium C is when we have a high phosphorus level, and that high phosphorus is what's feeding all the algae and creating the turbid lake. So those two different stable equilibria represent the two alternative stable states for our lake. Um, so that's giving us the sense of, an, of alternative stable states and how does the lake decide which to be in. And then we can ask one of my favorite questions, resilience question. So resilience is an interesting concept. It, sort of means the same thing for all of us, but it's in its details means different things for every different discipline and every different question. So I really enjoy doing resilience research with different scientists because we have to get deep into the question to know what does resilience mean here? But we'll stay at the surface right now. Let's just refer to resilience as how much disturbance the system can withstand. So let's say we start with a clear lake with all that nice vegetation and biodiversity. And so much algae grow that we cross the threshold. Then what's going to happen to the lake? We can see from the dynamics displayed on this um, phase line that the lake will shift to the turbid state because we cross that offstage actor threshold. Okay, other way around. I mean, that's kind of sad, that's unfortunate. But we put the lake into this state which sends it off to full turbidity. But we can think the other way around. Suppose the lake is turbid with not enough fish and we want to recover a clear lake. We only need to disturb just below the threshold. And an interesting piece of unusual science, this is not an, a solution you might expect, is if you don't have enough fish, remove some of the fish. And the reason we're removing some of these fish is because they're bottom feeders. So if we remove bottom feeders, then it allows, we've, we've got below the threshold of the feedback because it allows this, um, less mud. We're gonna have less mud stirred up. And so it allows the mud to settle and maybe that's just enough to let some light some, come through and now we can get into the feedback that sends us to um, a beautifully self-recovered clear lake. 
And so what I find a captivating math question is what about, instead of having one big disturbance, we've got repeated disturbances. And how and where do these disturbances accumulate? So we'll come back to that question later in the presentation. But for now, we've got this idea of alternative stable states. Let's just use that as a lens to look at the whole world. So we saw alternative stable states in our kayak. We've seen them with our turbid lake. And we saw that when you have these alternative stable states, sudden dramatic change can and does happen. Just like in the lake ecosystem, it can happen with the coral reefs. They can become algal dominated. So with the same temperature, same sunlight, you could have um, alternative stable states for the corals. And that's another sad situation as we send all this uh, nutrients down through the watershed out of the rivers and into the oceans. It can happen with fisheries. This is a graph of cod landings in the Gulf of Maine. It goes back to 1861, that was a long time ago. These were the, this is how much cod was coming in then. And then there was a crash. And this is the recovered fishery. This is up, going up to 1928. This is what more recently we've thought of as a fabulous fishery. But it's nothing compared to that, right? And yet this, is the, this was the stable state. Now it's crashed again. But um, so we see these sudden dramatic change. There are these potentially, we don't know for sure, but maybe there are these two alternative stable states for, the, for a cod fishery or many alternative stable states. We see it in desertification that um, grasslands as we gradually go into climate change, or maybe with, um, if you cross the threshold of too much grazing, will tip into um, desert, desert. We see it with Earth's energy balance. So coming right out and looking at the whole globe. At the moment, we live on an Earth that's very convenient for us, an Earth with ice caps. Back in geological history, we had snowball Earth, and the, that snowball earth was stable at the time. You might, we might ask, how did we ever get out of that snowball earth? Because um, it was a stable state. And uh, that's, I won't answer that today. It's an interesting question to explore. But what we're worried about today is not whether or not we might, the alternative stable state of snowball earth, we're much more worried about the alternative stable state of an earth with no ice. That once we get to an earth with no ice, the ice albedo feedback will make it really hard for us to ever recover any ice again. So those are big global questions we're thinking about. Going from the global down to the neuronal, right down inside our brains, neurons are excitable. Sometimes they're quiet, oops, let's go back there. Sometimes they're quiescent in these, these little intervals of um, not much activity, that's quiescence. And sometimes they're tonic firing, these intervals of lots and lots of firing, one after the other. These are the firing the signals that send electrical signals around our body. It's how we think and move and do everything. Um, and many neurons will oscillate between quiescence and firing. So they have these two, you could think of them as two alternative stable states. They could be quiescent, they could be firing. And there is something that's flipping them back and forth between these states. Let's go to social science, Facebook posts. So this is a really cute story, which you already saw the punchline of. Um, these kids wanted a puppy and their dad said to them that they could have a puppy if they could get 1 million likes. So they posted this on Facebook, it went viral. They got their million likes and sure enough, they got their puppy. So again, this is um, the, what happens when you post something on Facebook. It usually doesn't go viral. That stable state is not viral. Some of them go viral. Um, something that we're all struggling with right now is the spread of disease. Depending on how the reproductive efficiency of the disease, it could become a pandemic or it could just decline and we could become disease free. And right now we're all, the whole world over, working on how do we adjust the reproductive efficiency of this disease, right? So one way is to vaccinate ourselves, another way is to social distance, another way is to mask, another way is to gradually develop herd immunity through 
having had the disease. All these pieces are being brought together to try and get us below that reproductive threshold so the disease will die out. We don't have to eradicate it, it will die out if we get it below that threshold. Change again. Another part of our lives um, is in our endocrine systems. We see alternative stable states in our endocrine systems. So there's lots of experiments, where, particularly with dogs, where um, you look at the fight flight um, behavior. So if you corner a dog, it might, it might growl and be ready to attack or it might run away. Um, many animals do this with each other as they're um, displaying and finding out their hierarchy. Um, and then also related to our endocrine axes and our brains is our own moods, right? You know, when you're, you're happy and you're just happy. And as my father would put it, the slings and arrows of outrageous fortune might be coming at you, but you stay happy. And then suddenly it's too much and all of a sudden you snap to sad. And then we're kind of stuck in this blue funk and we stay in, and I don't know if it happens for you, but for me, I stay in this blue funk until suddenly I switch out of it again. It's not gradual. And the extremes are really sad, of course, the extremes are uh, manic and depression. But we, we, I think a lot of us experience it at some level of this snapping between alternative stable states of our moods. So, okay, what was the point of that little tour is that we can view, that we can look around the world and view the world through this lens of potential alternative stable states, um, which can lead to potential tip. So now I would like to channel my father for a few minutes. Actually, I'm channeling my father for this whole talk, but we'll do it very explicitly right now. So my father was um, Sir Christopher Zeman, another mathematician who loved dynamical systems and applying math to biology and, and talking about math to um, everybody, not just mathematicians. So he gave a series of Christmas lectures. Um, there were six of them. Three were about pure math and three were about applied math. So lecture number four is the first applied math lecture. In the intro to lecture number four, he gives us a survey of how he thinks of applied math. And it's like this. He divides the world of things into discrete and continuous. So here we go, things, discrete and continuous. And he divides the world of behavior into discrete and continuous. So here we have four boxes. So discrete things are things like dice and planets, and continuous things are things like waves and electricity. Discrete behavior might be throwing dice and they're rolling, whereas continuous behavior might be planets moving continuously in time around the universe, or around the sun anyway. Um, so let's look at these boxes one at a time. So when we have discrete things behaving discreetly like rolling dice, the mathematics we've developed for that is finite probability, finite groups, and my father referred to that as the discrete box. Let's look at the next box. This is the discrete things moving continuously. So that's because they're moving continuously in time. So he referred to that as the time box. And the mathematics we've developed for understanding those is ordinary differential equations. Okay, let's go to the next box. That's things like waves that move continuously in space. So he called that the continuous box and the mathematics we develop for that is partial differential equations. Okay, what's in the fourth box? That's things like, that's continuous things behaving discreetly. That's rather a surprise. That's, when look at the names we give it, tipping points, critical threshold, phase transitions. That's unusual stuff. There's surprises, it's unusual science. The name he gave to that box was Pandora's box. And the, some of them, we've developed all kinds of math and physics to explore Pandora's box, but um, some of the branches are bifurcation theory now and catastrophe theory is what his research was about. But this just, our theme is unusual science. This is a box full of unusual science. Okay. So now let's look at um, a gradually changing environment from a bifurcation theory point of view when we have alternative stable states. 
So we had our lake, remember? And we were modeling our lake with the phosphorus coming in and the phosphorus going out. Let's change gradually the, what's coming in on the watershed. So maybe we consider that the agricultural runoff is gradually increasing because we're gradually intensifying our farming practice. So if we've got more agricultural runoff, it's going to push the um, influx graph up a little bit. The gray graph is where it used to be. Here's the old graph. And this is the pushed up graph because of more runoff. Alternatively, we could have less runoff. We could be um, becoming more organic and sustainable and less fertilizer in our farming. Um, so then that was the, the gray is the old original position and this is the reduced less runoff position of that graph. So now let's see how that works in our model where we're looking at the daily change at the net flux. So you remember this where we had these three um, equilibria and one of, the, one of the attracting equilibria represented the clear lake and the other represented the turbid lake. So now let's increase the agricultural runoff, which means let's push the orange curve up a little bit. So what happens to the dynamics? So we see that the equilibrium C just moves up a little bit. The, what I'm showing now is the new equilibrium and the old equilibrium I've lost my cursor, there's the old equilibrium is here where the intersection with the old gray graph is. So we see C just moved up a little bit. And what happened to these two lower equilibria, they got a bit closer together. But apart from that, the phase line looks pretty much the same. There's still two stable equilibria, one clear, one turbid. What happens if we push the orange graph up a bit more? We increase the agricultural runoff a bit more. Now this is different. We've still got C, but the two lower equilibria have come together and coalesced. So you know you can see what's going to happen if we increase the agricultural runoff a bit more. Bam, oops, that's not what I meant to happen. Uh, there, bam, it's gone. So remember we had the two equilibria had coalesced, we increased a bit more, the two equilibria are gone. We've only got one equilibrium. It doesn't matter what phosphorus level we start with in the lake, it has to evolve up to the turbid level. And we'll explore this story some more, but let's have a look at if we lower, let's go back to our starting point and now lower the um, agricultural runoff. So now that means we lower our orange curve. And so this time it's the upper two equilibria that are coming together. And so you know what's gonna happen if we lower it a bit further. We'll lower it so there's no intersection up there and bam, those two equilibria have coalesced and disappeared. And now the only option for the lake is clear. So it doesn't matter what phosphorus level we start with, it's gonna clear, it's gonna self-clarify. So that's nice. And now what I'm doing is stacking up all those vertical lines. That's why it was so useful to have the lines vertical. We can stack them all up next to each other. All these equilibria, these high equilibria represent the turbid lake and all these low equilibria represent the clear lake. And we can see this pattern of equilibria developing so we have this, we just draw the equilibria. And so let's think about this, what, how do we read this graph now? So what's this axis? When we stacked all those up, this axis became an axis representing the amount of agricultural runoff. And the vertical axis was our phase line. It's our level of uh, phosphorus or turbidity. And so high represents turbid and low represents clear. So let's explore our story again in this graph. So there we started with a clear lake. And so we, so we know there are alternative stable states. The lake could have been turbid with this amount of phosphorus, but it's not. We're lucky, it's a clear lake. And now we increase the agricultural runoff a bit. And because our lake was clear, and because clear is that clear equilibrium, that equilibrium down here is stable, we move along, because we're moving along the agricultural runoff axis, we move along to this equilibrium, but it's still stable. And so we stay down there at the clear lake. Let's increase the agricultural runoff a bit more. We're still tracking that stable equilibrium. We're moving along our axis because we're increasing agricultural runoff, but we're still at this stable clear lake. But we know, because we've looked at the model a few minutes ago, we know this is, this is dangerous. There's not a very big 
basin of attraction there. These two equilibria are coming together to coalesce. So when we increase the agricultural runoff a bit more, bam, that lower equilibrium is gone. The low, the clear stable state for the lake is gone. This dramatic sudden shift to a turbid lake, which is what we see in the environment. We see, this is work by Carpenter and his colleagues, we see that lakes are typically either clear or turbid. They're not in that in-between state because that in-between state happens suddenly and rapidly in the lifetime of a lake. And so we get this sudden dramatic shift to a turbid lake with what appeared to be no warning. This is really troubling to us. It was clear, 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 bam, turbid. And so there's um, now in the last couple of decades, all kinds of beautiful and interesting math looking at, could we get warning? Could we look at what's going on in the mathematical dynamics as we come close to this coalescence point? There's all kinds of math going on there that could perhaps give us some warning signals for this um, sudden, this coalescence of the equilibria leading to the sudden shift. And so, and in that case, if we could use that math, what observations should we be making? As ecologists looking at our ecosystems, what observations should we make alongside just observing the clarity? And it, the kind of observations we should be making is how quickly, how quickly do things recover from the little disturbances that nature gives us all the time? Um, but okay, now we're stuck with this turbid lake. Let's try to recover it. Let's try to restore the lake. So of course, we're going to restore it. We want to reduce that agricultural runoff. So we reduce it. We do the work to reduce the runoff. So we reduce it a bit, but now because we're at this stable turbid system, there's all this feedback keeping us at the stable turbid system. So even though we've reduced the runoff, we're still up there at the turbid state. And if we reduce the runoff some more, now this is where we started. This is the amount of runoff we started with, but we're stuck in the turbid state. We used to be down here when we started, we were in the clear state, but we've allowed this history to happen that's now made us stuck in the turbid state. We keep reducing, we're still stuck in the turbid state. We keep reducing, we have to reduce all the way down there before we recover the clear lake. So we do eventually get this dramatic shift to the clear lake, but we have this idea of hysteresis, the fact that we have to pull back way beyond where we were. It's difficult to recover the clear lake. And it's because of those feedbacks. Once you get into a stable state, you're stuck in that stable state. So with this kind of reversibility, we have to reverse all the way to the point where that the turbid stable state is no longer stable, which is, a little discouraging as a manager trying to manage that system. Um, so let's just apply our minds a little bit more to, okay, if we've understood that system so well from a mathematical modeling point of view, maybe we can be a bit more creative about how to manage it. So let's try again to restore it. Let's reduce it to a point where we are confident because of the history of the lake, we are confident that there are alternative stable states here. We know that in the past, with this much runoff, we had a clear stable state. So we're confident it exists, even though we're not observing it. And so now, since it exists, let's try reach it. Let's try reach it by manipulating the lake, because we already talked about how we could get below this threshold. We could get below that threshold by removing some of the bottom fish. So there's, and now the lake will self recover. So understanding that system, and you could understand that system purely scientifically, but it might be helpful to understand that system mathematically to help you visualize and explore the different kinds of restoration mechanisms in this example. And we talked about, we talked about all the different parts of the world you could view through this lens. So this, I'm just giving you this one example as um, thoughts for, using math to come up with creative solutions where we might not have seen them. So let's, um, let's channel my father again. So he's, he worked on catastrophe theory. So lecture number six, 
So down here, if you Google him, those Christmas lectures and look at lecture number six, it's about catastrophe and psychology. And you recognize this curve at the front? That's the curve we've just been looking at. And um, in catastrophe theory, what they were doing was thinking about systems which are all have a minimizing principle, some kind of minimizing energy, but then thinking about more than one parameter controlling the output of the system. So we were thinking about the phosphorus parameter, but I'll, I'll, another independent parameter is the depth of the lake. And then this surface is a generic equilibrium surface um, over that two dimensional control space. And when you think, when you start increasing the dimension of the control space, you are, you open yourself up to so many more possible management strategies. And so we're, if you've liked this so far, you're in a perfect position to go watch lecture number six and think about um, the ideas that can come from having a two dimensional control space and a two dimensional surface to move around as you're trying to manage your system. But I would like to now move to from gradually changing environment to repeated kicks, so discreetly changing environment. So we had, remember the classification was discrete things and discrete behaviors. And now I would like to add to that continuous versus discrete changes to the environment. So we just looked at continuous changes to the environment. Now let's look at discrete changes. So that was that captivating math question. What if we have repeated discrete disturbances? How do those disturbances accumulate? So for example, suppose we have a little um, sudden input of P, maybe there's a big rainfall, which means a sudden um, runoff of lots more of the agricultural fertilizer coming into the watershed or industry, whatever it is. So it's not enough to cross the threshold, it's fine. After that event, the lake will start recovering. But maybe there's another event before the lake has fully recovered. Oops, wrong way, sorry. Another event before the lake has fully recovered. And so we've got another phosphorus kick. It's gone up a little bit more. But now there's a break and so the lake gets to recover. Okay, now there's another event before the lake had fully recovered. And you can see what's happening. The question is that that interaction of kicks and recovery, will they cross the threshold? Is this clear lake resilient to this um, disturbance pattern of kick and recovery time? So some of my colleagues and I um, in this paper in Nature Sustainability ask what disturbance patterns can a system withstand? So if we've got one of these models, for example, we looked at this, this example of the lake model, and we can look at disturbance space. So this is a graph of, we could, the numbers are not relevant because we haven't talked about the numbers in our, in our lake example. But along here is the recovery time. And up the vertical axis is the nutrient pulse magnitude. Oh, sorry. It's the size of the kick. Up the vertical axis is the size of the kick. Along the horizontal axis is the recovery time between the kicks. And so a point in this plane is a disturbance pattern. It's saying every five months or whatever, there's going to be a big rainfall that, that kicks this much, kicks 20 units of nutrient into the lake. So, and that's gonna happen every five months. So that's a disturbance pattern of very regular, regular timed, regular size kicks. And this resilience boundary that we've drawn and that we've computed this blue curve is bounding the disturbance patterns to which the lake is resilient. So if we start with a clear lake, any disturbance pattern under that boundary will maintain a clear lake. So it separates them, sorry, from the disturbance patterns that the clear lake cannot withstand. So any disturbance pattern above that boundary leads to a turbid lake. So that's, once you have a model, if you actually have a model with um, mathematical quantitative terms, you can always compute this boundary. Um, so that gives us a lot of leeway to understand which disturbance patterns or which collections of disturbance patterns or how much stochast stochasticity in the disturbance patterns can the lake 
um, withstand and stay clear. So that's, that's for me, captivating. I love doing that. And now I want to um, just finish off with a few minutes thinking about it from yet another a direction, another way of thinking, which could also be viewed by modern scientists as unusual science, by indigenous peoples as absolutely natural science, depends on your viewpoint. So um, that you may have read this book, Braiding Sweetgrass by Robin Wall Kimmerer. So Dr. Kimmerer is a plant ecologist and is the founding director of the Center for Native Peoples in the Environment at, um, at one of the CUNY schools in uh, Syracuse. And the mission of this center is to develop programs which draw on the wisdom of both indigenous people and scientific knowledge for our shared goals of sustainability. And this book, if you haven't read this book, I can't recommend it highly enough. It's a beautiful interweaving of ecology as we think, as modern science thinks of it and traditional native um, management and interaction with the land around them. It's really beautifully written. And I actually listened to it on, um, on Audible where it is read by the author. So she adds so much to the lyricism of the book in her reading. But anyway, one of her chapters, which is called A Mother's Work, has a beautiful description of her own pond in her own garden. When she bought this, her home, the pond was just totally turbid. It was on its way, not through agricultural runoff, but through time. It had been filled with leaf litter and plant debris and was on its way to becoming a swamp and no longer a pond. But the locals told her that just a few decades ago, they used to swim in it. It was lovely, clear, it was their favorite watering hole. And her kids wanted to swim in it. So she has this, that's why it's a mother's work. She has this beautiful description combining the hard work it takes to do this and all kinds of ecological detail about what she finds in the pond along the way, where each year she removes some algae. So here she, here she is removing some algae and then the algae grows back, but not quite as far as it was. And the next year she removes some more algae and so it goes on. And she does this for at least, um, she talks about doing it for 12 years. And at the end of 12 years, she's got a pond she can swim in. But it's a really beautiful description of these repeated disturbances and how you can just win. In, this, in, her, in her example, she's disturbing just enough that the, the uh, turbidity doesn't recover. They don't balance her disturbance wins. Um, so we could view that as exploring the resilience boundary, not for the clear pond this time, but the resilience boundary for the turbid state. So it's still a stable state, we can still think about its resilience boundary. So this time we could think about all the disturbance patterns for which the pond stays turbid versus the disturbance patterns which clear it. And so she's working somewhere up here with a disturbance pattern which is gradually clearing the pond. Taking that idea, um, oh, actually not taking that idea anywhere, looking at another example that she describes, two more examples she describes in the book. Um, she talks about sweetgrass and black ash. So sweetgrass is a grass, black ash is a tree. These are both really important species for um, the indigenous people, Canada and America and the States. Um, partly for their use in basket weaving. Um, and so this basket, here's a beautiful traditional basket, which is made of sweetgrass. Sweetgrass is the thin stuff and black ash is the broad stuff. So she talks about the ecology of both of these species and the interaction of the ecology of the species with the native peoples. So I'm going to talk about her sweetgrass example. And what was being observed was that sweetgrass was disappearing from places where it had historically been known to thrive. And she was asked the question, why? And is it because of the harvesting method? So the uh, traditional basket weavers were harvesting two different waves. One, one group were harvesting very carefully, pinching off grass, a grass stem at a time at its base and carefully not disturbing the roots. And the other group were just pulling up grass by the handful, taking some roots and leaving a ragged gap in the sod. Both groups were practicing the honorable harvest. 
the honorable harvest means, in, among other things, that you never take more than half of what's there. So none of them were taking more than half, but one was doing it with this very delicate pinching and the other was ripping up the grasses. So she set up um, an experiment. She had three experimental plots, she and her graduate students. So there were two plots where they were harvesting, one by method A and one by method B, and another control plot where there was no harvest. And where they were harvesting, they harvested half the stems. And after two years, what they saw was that the two harvested plots were full and healthy, full of shiny golden green sweetgrass. The control plot, which had not been harvested, was dull and brown and choked with stems. And people who work with grasses and, and grasslands and ranges know this, but it was, um, it can be surprising in this context, but if you harvest a grass, the conclusion is harvesting the grass allows it to thrive. And so this concern that harvesting was destroying it was completely wrong. And their conclusion was instead that it was the loss of the traditional harvesting that was causing the sweet grass to disappear. And when they looked geographically at where the sweet grass was, where the sweet grass was still thriving, it was in the neighborhood of the indigenous people who were still doing basket work. So harvesting allows the sweet grass to thrive. This is that beautiful interaction between people and their environment. In the indigenous teaching, this is um, the, the basic lesson here is, is worded as if we use a plant respectfully, it will flourish. If we ignore it, it will go away. In modern science, we call it disturbance promotes biodiversity. And if we wanted to think about it from that dynamic math point of view, we could say, I'm not bothering with alternative stable states anymore. I'm just thinking about crowding itself out, declining to nothing, being a stable state and being something that we, could, we might want to explore. So the grass is crowding itself out, it's declining then you harvest it, which is disturbing it, which is making room for new growth. But then it crowds itself out some more. Can you get the disturbance of the crowding to balance? That seems to be what's happening, right? In many, many ecosystems, the disturbance and the crowding balance. And it's that same captivating math question of what's, and so phrased in terms of math, if you disturb the system, how is that interacting with the transient dynamics of the system? We've spent a lot of our um, dynamical systems decades exploring the asymptotic behavior of the system and where many, many aspects of math are now forcing us to look more carefully back at the transient dynamics of the system um, and how that interacts with the disturbances that this is, the system is experiencing. So I think that's a great place for us to stop. We've looked at alternative stable states, different ways of thinking about tipping. We've looked at how continuous changes to the environment could create a tip. We've looked at how continuous changes to the environment not only might take, create a tip, but also, um, sorry, discrete changes to the environment not only cre could create a tip, but also can give us stability in a part of the environment, in a part of the ecosystem that promotes biodiversity. So, okay, thank you very much. Well, thank you very much, Mary Lou. So it's really a pleasure that you have decided to talk to us about uh, unusual science and how math uh, mathematics really has a, a role to play. It's a bit, uh, frightening to see this very smooth change that lead to such uh, dramatic changes in the world around us. It uh, can be well, frightening, but we can also try using it to our advantage. It's a great lesson to learn. We don't only have to be frightened of it. Okay, now that, that's a very interesting lesson. Are there some questions? Okay, I, have, I see a thank you for the amazing presentation. So if you have questions, please, thank please you, uh, write them in the chat. Okay, I, I may have one before uh, there is. 
Is there a way that we can see we're approaching a tipping Thank point? You, Lala. Is there a way to, that we can see we're approaching tipping point? That's, um, so I'll answer that at a kind of math level. So as we, if the tipping point is caused by a bifurcation, such as the coalescence of those two equilibria, then that means that the, um, the linearized behavior, the eigenvalues of those equilibria, at least one of them is, is approaching zero. This, so there's what we call critical slowing down. So that was the math way of saying it. So the science way of saying it is if you disturb the system away from that equilibrium, the closer you get to the closer you get to the tipping point, the more slowly the recovery will happen. When you're far away from the tipping point, a small disturbance will recover quickly. When you're close to the tipping point, a small disturbance will recover more slowly, if it's this kind of tip that comes from a bifurcation. And so you can try looking at um, just the time, the time series of what's happening in your system, because all the time you're getting little disturbances. This is what nature does for us. All the time there's a slight change in temperature, there's a little extra rainfall, there's a little extra runoff. So if you were carefully measuring how fast you're returning to, um, to the equilibrium, then it's possible that you may have a proxy for how close you are to the tip. And it's a little bit controversial. There are people have published um, research saying, look, it works. In all these different situations, it works. And other people have published research saying, yes, but it gives you a bunch of false positives and a bunch of false negatives. And you know, maybe, maybe it's okay that we're still looking for something, even if it gives us false positives and false negatives. It's better than no signal at all. And it's stimulating a lot more research by people trying to refine it. So I think it is that. I think there may well be tips that are much harder pre to predict than that, but that there are some tips that we could develop the math to predict and the math that helps us design the, the um, data collection that will help us predict. Okay, so now we have- uh, And somebody's, somebody knows a lot about this. Big data, um, tipping point for COVID-19 vaccination resilience yes okay the tipping point yes what is the, right of vaccination for deco for, uh, for uh, uh, deconfinement is probably a french word but okay that's okay we understand what it means release from lockdown yeah in israel 60 percent of the population in uk 50 percent okay do you want to address, in fact, that's, that's the question, the tipping point of vaccination. Do you want to say something? Uh, oh, right, uh, so oh, let me read the question. I was, still, yeah. I was reading with you a question. How could we use the big data feedback we get from the other countries now and the tipping point mathematics to foresee more precisely the percentage of vaccinated people required to implement the deconfinement point in USA and Canada? Oh, good question. Because it's not only about the, um, it's not only about the vaccination percentage, it's also about how many people have had the disease. So it's about how, how effectively did the country go into lockdown? The more effectively the country went into lockdown, the fewer people have already had the disease. So the fewer people have developed immunity that way. It's also of course about what variant of the diseases out there, but let's suppose we're talking about, we're all talking about the same original variant. So why is it that in Israel, it's only 60% and in the UK it's 50%? I would guess, I'm purely guessing that it's because the disease was more rampant in the UK before they went into lockdown. And so there, but I, who's asked the question? You know better than I do. Jean this is jo Jean Noël. Maybe, maybe we can open. Where is he? There are not so many people. Can we open his? Yeah, just let's. Uh, his micro, his, his microphone. Um, I don't know if I. Can, uh, so, are you still there, Jean Noël? Yeah, I see him. Okay. You might be speaking to us, but you're muted, so okay. we can't hear you. Well, he do, he asked to speak, but uh, am I able, uh, Yvette? Are you able to? Uh, Oh, do you have to? Uh, I'm not uh, an expert in Zoom. 
Oh, I'm a co-host. Maybe I can do it. Yeah. Can you give all participants? Yeah, please. If you can do, all participants can speak. Um. Okay, I I break the yeah. the people. Okay, so now. If you want to speak, just acti uh, activate your microphone. You will be able and I'll, to it. I'll stop screen sharing so that we can see each other better. Yeah. Jean-Noël, do you want to, to speak? Maybe we lost him. OK, so somebody else wants to ask a question. Well, surely for the question of uh, vaccination, what's clear is that we see that there will be a tipping point. Okay, quantitatively, it's difficult to know where it is, but qualitatively, we know that. And in fact, that's what we see in Canada between Ontario and uh, Quebec. Uh, Quebec now, vaccination, we, we are sort of having the disease decreasing and in Ontario, they are on the other side. Right, right. And it's, I mean, there are ways of, quantifying it it's the it's well this is just saying the same thing is that we're trying to get the reproductive the effective reproductive number of the disease down below one um but i i it's a good question how could we use the big data feedback we get from other countries i'm afraid i don't know but i'm sure there are people thinking about it oh you're oh, no, it's not. I'll ask a question and maybe we'll take mm -hmm. you out of your comfort zone, but has there been any ecologist using the mathematical model you've presented us to switch a, a lake from its turbid uh, Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah, so, and so I should say, I am not presenting my work. I'm presenting the work that all that work of, um, is the work of uh, Carpenter, Carpenter and Sheffer, who were referenced in there, Sheffer, I think you're supposed to pronounce it, and all and their colleagues, and they absolutely have um, restored lakes. They have restored lakes by by thinking about this model and then showing the model works. Yeah. So Carpenter, I think, is and and Sheffer are the two names to look up. I'll put them in the. So I can't claim any. Um, credit for that, absolutely none. I'm just reporting on their work. There we go. Thanks. Pleasure. It's, it's a nice way to end the story that it actually yes. works. <laughs> yes, absolutely. That's right. And that and it's um Sefa and his colleagues are also so maybe Dakos is a good name to look up. I'm a little behind the time here, but these are two. Oh, I, I didn't mean to spell Makos. D A K O S. And Schaeffer are um, two names for the that might get you into the right Google <coughs> Google Basin of Attraction for um, um, early warning signals, and also Hastings is good for that. He's an alternative approach to early warning signals. Thank you. Pleasure. More questions? Okay, so if there are no more questions, I see on the chat and I will uh, thank you for the amazing presentation and great and amazing discourse. So, <laughs> so really it was uh, very stimulating and we are very grateful, Mary Lou, that uh, you it's a great pleasure to be, to be with us tonight. So thank you very much. Thank you. And thank you for organizing it. What a nice idea to have this Quebec event. Yeah, it's stimulating and inspiring. Yes, yes. Okay. Yes. And thank you for coming to a math talk on a Friday evening. Thank okay. you. Super, super. <laughs> Great. So we all uh, wish you a very nice summer and we hope to meet yes. you uh, next fall. Yes, Maybe not yes. In the pandemic. 
Steimer. That's right. That's right. Let's see everywhere get below that tipping point. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, everybody. Thank you for those nice messages.